This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to ER Vet on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Jess Lee, and I'm an emergency critical care veterinary specialist and toxicologist. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about cancer in dogs and cats, a really important topic, especially as our pets age. We'll be right back after these messages. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. ER Vet on Pet Life Radio. Today, I'm really excited to speak with Dr. Andy Flory, who's the Chief Medical Officer and the co founder of Pet TX and a board certified veterinary oncologist. Dr. Flory, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Justine. It's really great to be here. Awesome. Just so our audience knows who you are, do you mind giving us a little bit of background about who you are, where you train, what you do, and how you're different from a traditional veterinarian? Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm a medical oncologist, which means I did extra training to treat cancer in dogs and cats. My background is that I grew up in Ohio and I did training at the Ohio State University and also at Cornell. And after that, I worked in various places. I worked at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. I worked in Australia and then in San Diego, which is where I was working when I met an adorable little patient named Poppy that really just changed everything for me. Unfortunately, Poppy had a cancer diagnosis that was just too late. And because of that, her owner and I co-founded a company called PetDX to develop a test called a liquid biopsy test. And this test is called Oncocanine and it detects cancer with just a blood draw. All right. You know, I have so many questions on that, of which I'm going to ask you later, because oftentimes in the ER, you know, I'm going to oftentimes do like complete blood work, x-rays, things like that. And so many times when I do that blood work, one of the first questions owners will ask me is, but I thought the blood work tested for that. So, you know, great, great technology that you're uh, talking about. And we'll bring that up in just a minute. But I wanted to ask some important questions. What are some important things for pet owners to know about canine cancer and how it affects dogs and cats? So the biggest thing to know is that cancer is a huge problem in dogs and cats. It's actually the number one cause of death in dogs and dogs have about a one in three risk in their lifetime of developing cancer in cats. It's about one in five. And there are a couple of things that really increase the risk of cancer. The biggest one is age. So for example, in dogs, we know that the risk of cancer increases after the age of seven in most dogs, but there are some breeds that are at higher risk even by the age of four. That includes some of the giant breed dogs. We did a study recently that showed that boxers and bulldogs are at risk earlier and are at risk even from the age of four. So it's important to kind of just understand that dogs are at risk of cancer, cats as well, and it's important to kind of know that about this, have it on your radar, and talk with your veterinarian about it. Unfortunately, when I work in the ER, it's really, really frustrating because a lot of owners have never met me before. You know, they usually have a long-term relationship with their family practitioner, and now they come into the ER for something as vague as like vomiting or even, you know, not feeling well or not wanting to eat for a couple of days, and I'm making the diagnosis of cancer. And it can be really hard for a pet owner to hear that news. I wanted to step back and say, first of all, what are some of the most common clinical signs of cancer that we should be looking out for, especially as our pets age? 
when it comes to dogs and cats? Like what are some of the most common signs? Yeah. I mean, I would say sometimes it can be really vague, right? Like they're sleeping more or they're a little lethargic. Appetite changes are a big thing. Um, Stool and urine changes, even water intake changes. All of these things that you notice at home, if you're noticing a change, you should definitely bring this up with your veterinarian. Sometimes it's a little more focused in terms of what you might notice at home. Like you might notice a swelling or pain in one leg, which you see as limping. You might notice that your dog or cat is losing weight. So any of these kind of signs, these are unfortunately common signs that can be any number of things, but would be really important to talk with your veterinarian about because especially as our pets are aging, they are at higher risk of cancer and they could indicate cancer. All right. Thank you. You know, it's so hard because the signs are vague, but I always tell people if you notice anything, especially chronic, like your dog is vomiting, you know, once or twice a week for several weeks, or your cat's just getting a little bit thinner. Uh, Sometimes it's that lump or that mass that's slowly getting bigger and bigger to weird things. Again, like you had mentioned, like the limping to difficulty breathing. You know, unfortunately, there's a whole gamut of clinical signs that uh, can be representative of cancer. So I would say when in doubt, we always want to be able to catch it earlier than later. Now, I had mentioned before, oftentimes in the ER, I'm discovering cancer or even advanced cancer where it's already metastasized on x-rays or ultrasound. And a lot of times the traditional blood work that I do, such as a complete blood count and a chemistry panel or even a urine test are completely normal. And for those of you guys who have listened to Pet Life Radio ER Vet for a long time, you probably remember an old episode with Dr. Garrett Pactinger where we talked about some of the tests that we do in the ER. And this is a really important one to go back to listen to because a lot of times people will pay for the blood test, but they don't actually know what they're testing for. And that's where it's so important that your veterinarian or your ER veterinarian communicate that to you. Now, again, oftentimes when I'm seeing it, I'm breaking terrible news to my pet owners. Could early detection help prevent this scenario? And what can we do? Is it a matter of getting into our vet earlier? Is it a matter of doing x-rays or ultrasound once a year? What do you recommend? Yeah, so early detection can certainly make a huge difference. When we talk about early detection of cancer, we really mean two things. Early detection can mean early stage detection when we find cancer before it's spread. But early detection can also mean finding it early before your pet is sick. And both of those have a lot of advantages. For example, it often makes cancer easier to treat. Sometimes we have a better chance at long-term control or even cure if we find it earlier as opposed to later. And it's often going to be mean a better outcome for your pet in terms of when we treat that cancer, they tend to do better. So early detection is always important. And when we think about cancer detection, we really mostly find cancer, like you mentioned, when they're coming into the ER or they're coming in sick, they're coming in with something noticeable that's happening at home. And so when it comes to that, in terms of diagnosis, we have a lot of the same tools to diagnose cancer in dogs and cats as we do in people. However, most of the time when we're finding cancer because pets are already sick, often cancer can be quite advanced. And that means that we can't provide that long-term control or even cure. So if we can shift that conversation to finding cancer earlier and doing screening, which has made a huge impact in cancer survival in people, then this could really give us a leg up in terms of being able to control cancer for longer. And screening, what that really means is looking for cancer when patients are asymptomatic. So for example, in people, we have mammograms, we have colonoscopies, we have PSA tests, and these are tests that we go for Once we reach a certain age, typically, meaning we're starting to become at higher risk for cancer, we go for to try to find those cancers earlier so that if we are going to develop that disease, we have a better chance at controlling it in the long term. All right. So we already talked about like doing that complete blood count, doing that chemistry panel, doing chest x-rays, doing abdominal ultrasound. In terms of technology, do you mind just talking and describing what is liquid biopsy, what it tests for, and what breeds you might want to consider running that test or talking to your veterinarian about it? So yeah, so liquid biopsy, what this really is, it is a blood-based test. It's looking for circulating tumor DNA. What this means is that this is little bits of DNA that are being released from cancer cells. 
So it's really looking for the current presence of cancer in the body. One thing that's important to understand is that it's not a risk prediction test. It's really looking for evidence of cancer in the body. And so the way this works is that adding this to a wellness visit, for example, can increase your veterinarian's ability to catch cancer early. Because if we have an indication on this blood test that there's cancer DNA present in the blood, then we know to go and look for it and find it. And then we can talk about treatment and hopefully the outcomes can be better. So how often do you recommend doing liquid biopsy and like how is a test done? Is it painful? How long does the result take? Do you recommend doing it every single year or every six months in high risk breeds like golden retrievers? Absolutely. Yeah. So you're thinking of exactly the right line. So really, this is a test that's meant to be kind of paired with your wellness visit. So if your dog is having a once a year wellness visit or twice a year wellness visit, this is something that can be paired right in with that wellness visit so that if there is going to be cancer that develops, that we have the best chance of catching it. Just like with any cancer screening test that we go through, we go through those on a cadence or on a serial test so that if we are going to develop, we have a chance to catch it earlier. In terms of how it's performed, this is a simple blood draw. So your veterinarian has access to uh, requesting the special tubes that are needed to run the test through the common diagnostic labs that they work with. And so they have access to that or directly through our company, PetDX. If you're interested in finding out more, you can jump on to PetDX.com and add your name to the interest list and we can reach out and share information as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, I will say, even though I do ER practice with my own pets as they age, so for me, this is greater than a 10-year-old cat. Uh, For a dog, usually this is seven to eight years of age. I usually do routine blood work screening and a physical exam. And I even have this on my calendar for me to do at home uh, for my own pets, because as we age, and of course, we can see cancers in all ages of pets, but as we age, we do know that we can see more cancer. So I always do routine blood work just to screen my pet. Now, quick question for the cat owners out there. Is liquid biopsy available or potentially available in the future for cats? It's not yet, but stay tuned. It's definitely coming. Uh, We know that that cats are really important as well in this cancer conversation. So stay tuned. It is on the way. All right. Now, we talked about this before, but what specific cancers does it test for? So yeah, this is a multi-cancer detection test, which means it detects actually 30 different types of cancer that it was shown in the clinical validation study to detect. This includes the most common cancers that happen in dogs. So for example, the detection rate in the eight most common cancers that we see in veterinary medicine, 62%. And in the top three, so these really common but very aggressive cancers, which are lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma, the test can detect 85% of these with a very low false positive rate of only 1.5%. This really means that this is a broad screening test that can detect a wide variety of cancers, including the most common cancers that happen in dogs. All right. And, you know, for dog owners out there, I've mentioned it before in a previous episode, just talking about some of these three cancers. I mean, sarcoma is often a really aggressive, sort of like a blood or tissue loving type of cancer. And unfortunately, when I typically see it in the ER vet, it results in severe internal bleeding. And it's often my favorite breeds that get it. So German Shepherds, Labrador Retrievers, Golden Retrievers. And I'm so paranoid about this cancer because it grows really aggressively on the spleen and liver. And by the time that I see it, unfortunately, the ER, again, it's often too late because by the time that tumor, that cancer is ruptured on the spleen, it really spreads cancer cells. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's you know life-saving surgery, blood transfusions, which can be tens of thousands of dollars and it's really expensive. So again, the fact that um, there's a blood test for it is amazing. With lymphoma, lymphoma is a type of cancer that can really, really affect even younger dogs. So I've seen, unfortunately, dogs as young as two or three years of age where all of a sudden their lymph nodes are really, really prominent. So if you're petting your dog, you all of a sudden notice lumps underneath their neck area or in their shoulder area. That's the kind of stuff you always want to get to a veterinarian right away because with treatment, the prognosis is actually fair with chemotherapy. So again, the sooner we can diagnose a problem, the sooner we can treat it. And then the last one, Dr. Fleury already mentioned, osteosarcoma. 
something as simple as limping or, you know, a dog's walking and all of a sudden fractures their leg, they're super painful. I see this, unfortunately, a lot in greyhounds. And it's something that can be quite severe. Um, it's a type of bone cancer. So the fact that we can potentially diagnose cancer earlier is so, so helpful because I always feel like cancer is one of the top three diagnoses that I unfortunately make in the ER. So again, a really, really important that you talk to your veterinarian about this. Now, how can pet owners broach the cancer conversation with their veterinarians? What can this conversation deliver? So I think the important thing is really to talk to your veterinarian about your dog's risk for cancer. And one thing that can be helpful in that conversation is a tool that we developed based on a study that we performed. And the tool is called the Cancer Safe Tool, S-A-F-E, which stands for Screening Age for Early Detection. This is a tool that was put together based on a large study we did in over 3,000 dogs to understand the best age to start cancer screening for your dog based on your pet's age, breed, and weight. So you can use this tool. It's at cancersafe.petdx.com. And you can use this to really understand when should we start looking for cancer in your dog. And you can bring that up with your veterinarian to talk about what tests they recommend for screening for cancer. This might include, like you mentioned, you know, physical exam, routine lab work. Um, sometimes your veterinarian might recommend imaging. And now we have this new blood test called liquid biopsy that can help us to detect more cancer earlier as well. We'll be right back with Dr. Flory right after these messages. Molly, here's your dinner. <coughs> Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> back to ER Vet on Pet Life Radio. We've been speaking with Dr. Andy Flory, a board-certified veterinary oncologist, about what we can do to help detect cancer earlier in our furry family members. And the main reason why is the sooner we diagnose something, the sooner we can treat it. We've talked about the clinical signs and some of the top cancers that we see in dogs. We've also talked about some of the tests that can be done, the benefits of diagnosing cancer earlier in our dogs or our cats. Yeah, great question. So early detection, really meaning either before a cancer has spread or before a pet is really sick, has a lot of benefits for the family. That often means that they have time to kind of think about what they want to do. When we're able to detect cancer, for example, when our patients are stable, when they're not sick, and before it's spread, we have time to do things like schedule the treatment. We can do it when it makes sense for the clinic and for the family. The family has time to kind of consider their options. And for the pet, there's definitely going to be benefits of not having to kind of go through those, unfortunately, trips to the ER, right, which can be scary. They might happen in the middle of the night. As you mentioned, sometimes those come with a hefty price tag or a need for um, things like blood transfusions or things like this. So when we can do this in a more relaxed manner, it's going to be better for the pet. It's going to be better for the family. And it's going to be better for that veterinary care team because an early diagnosis conversation is always going to be easier than that too late one. When it comes to diagnosing it early and it comes to treating, do you mind just talking a little bit about what does treatment entail? I think a lot of pet owners often think of a two-legged beloved family member who went through cancer treatment, went through radiation therapy, went to chemotherapy, all their hair fell out. They were super nauseous. They were really affected by it. Do you mind just talking about the difference between human medicine versus veterinary medicine when it comes to treating pets with cancer? And 
are the protocols the same or are the same drugs used? Do we do radiation therapy in veterinary medicine? That's a great question. So we've got a few basic tools that we use to treat cancer in dogs and cats, and they're really the same tools that are used in people, but we kind of apply them a little bit differently. Some of the tools that we have that are very similar are things like surgery. We have things like medical therapy. So these would be things that make your pet feel better. And then we have chemotherapy and radiation. Now, when we approach treating cancer in our pets, the approach is a little bit different than it is in people because our goal is really quality of life at all times. So our goal as oncologists, as veterinarians is to provide your pet the best quality of life that we can for the longest period of time, which means we want them to feel good. We want them to be happy. We want them to kind of go for walks and do all of the things that your pet normally does. And so what that means is that we design cancer treatments for dogs and cats to maximize quality of life while we're controlling the the cancer, which is a little bit of a different approach than is taken to treat cancer in people where the goal is usually cure, which means that higher doses are used and side effects are very common. Whereas in dogs and cats, side effects are less common because we're really maximizing quality of life and we're prioritizing that over anything else. And we really want to design the doses around keeping them feeling good much for saying that, you know, I oftentimes have owners really, really worried about the hair loss, really worrying about quality of life. When it comes to chemotherapy or some of this treatment, I will disclose that when my own beloved pit bull was diagnosed with a brain tumor, I instantly got in a car, drove him to Colorado State University, which is one of the leaders for oncology and ended up spending a lot of money to do something called stereotactic radiation therapy. And I was able to get 13 months with my dog and it was 13 months of relatively good quality of life. That's when I made that decision to humanely euthanize him. But I know for me that SRT or that stereotactic radiation therapy was really four treatments in one week. And so, yes, my dog had to be under anesthesia briefly uh, during that time period. But sometimes, depending on the type of cancer, you might not be reaching for radiation therapy. You may be reaching for chemotherapy instead. And some of this can be done at your vet. So the question is, when do you refer? Like when should a pet owner go to their veterinarian or when should they make an appointment with an oncologist? And do you mind just talking to me about the differences of whether or not that chemotherapy should be done at your vet or with an oncologist? Yeah, great question. So I would say that in general, there are medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and surgical oncologists. And these are veterinarians that have special training in treating cancer with those various types of treatment. And sometimes these are treatments that cannot be performed at your at your primary care veterinarian. So if it's a type of cancer that your veterinarian has treatment options for, then absolutely you can continue that care with your primary care veterinarian. But in some cancers, there are benefits to going to see a cancer specialist to just one, find out your options and two, see if there are additional treatments that maybe there is access at the specialty hospital or like you went to a university setting or something like this, where they may have access to novel therapies or additional therapies. And so depending on kind of what fits for you and what decision you make for your pet, then you may want access to those alternative treatments. I know I'm super grateful for board certified veterinary oncologists out there. You know, most of the time, pet owners oftentimes don't know what the difference is between a board certified specialist and a general practitioner. And I always say your family practitioner is the way to go. You want to go with them. You want to check with them because you have a long-term relationship with them. But if it's something more complex, something that requires advanced diagnostics, you definitely want to consult with a veterinary specialist. And it doesn't necessarily mean your vet has to necessarily refer you. You can even self-refer. I personally will say my little word of advice is if your pet was just diagnosed with cancer or you suspect your pet was diagnosed with cancer, I always recommend calling to make an appointment immediately with a board certified oncologist because oftentimes it takes like four to eight weeks to even get an appointment. And that way, depending on what you do, you can always cancel that appointment closer to date. But I always say it's worth talking to an oncologist because they are the experts in diagnosis and treatment. 
And just because you make that appointment doesn't commit you to having to do chemotherapy or radiation therapy. But again, you're talking to the expert who can give you the best information on how you can treat your pet and what your options are. Dr. Flory, any last tips you want to leave with us? Yeah. I mean, I would just say in response to that, I definitely agree. I think just going for the consultation, it's not a commitment to to proceeding with any therapy, but you can at least find out what your treatment options are. And all oncologists will really provide you with an array of options that include everything from kind of more minimal approach to kind of, you know, a more advanced approach and help you really make the decision that's right for you and your family. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all that you do and really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. Find me at drjustinelee.com on Facebook or Instagram at Dr. Justine Lee, or email me your pet questions at drjustine at petliferadio.com. With that, we're out of time and we want to thank our guests, Dr. Andy Flory and Mark Winter, our producer, for making the show possible. See you at the next episode. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.